How to Grow Grass Annoyingly Fast. Hey, this is Justin Hitt from Prosperity Homestead, and I'm going to show you a, a layman's terms method that you can use to start growing grass annoyingly fast. Now, what do I mean by that? It means thick, lush grass growing fast every day, adding inches every week. As you've seen in many of my podcast videos, the, the grass just goes crazy, especially after rain. I can add a foot of height to that grass, and it's all because of a unique system that I've put together that honors soil biology, honors what the grass needs, and ultimately cultivates thick luscious pastures. Now I say annoyingly fast because if you do this in an urban space, as I found out, you're going to get in a lot of trouble because it's a grass system that is designed to hold soil in place, to create deep roots, to capture a large amount of carbon, to be resilient against wildlife and other wear and tear that happens in an environment, to stand up against heavy rains. Because in Martinsville, Henry County, we can get up to 40 inches of rain a year, sometimes two inches at a time. And so this grass system had to be durable and grow quickly so that it can take up space. Now, this is the kind of grass system you might put in place after a logging project. So somebody's removed trees, they've regraded it, and now you want grass to stay in place. You want that grass to thrive. It could be a system you use in an area that has animal traffic. So you're doing a rotational system, and you want that grass to grow back before the animals get onto it. This is an excellent system to use. Now, I'm going to cover the system at a high level in a way that you can actually implement it, and it has three key elements. Number one, the enzyme activity in the soil. Number two, the types of seed and, and plant you put out. And number three, the cycle in which you cut it. Okay, because you don't need to cut it. It could be grazing, but there's a cycle involved. Number one, uh, the soil must be biologically active and allow for the exchange of nutrients. What does that mean? Well, it means there's a bunch of microbes down there, a bunch of uh, funguses and bacterias and different things that colonize the soil that help convert minerals into usable plant material and then also allows uh, nutrients to come out. So, th so part of this is the soil biology. Part of this is the pH level of the soil. But as you've seen in my videos, I've been able to grow grass on clay. And the way that we do this is we use lime to bring up the, the pH to a neutral level or bring down the pH to a neutral level. You could test your soil. And then what we apply to that grass is to that area that's going to have grass is fermented liquids. OK, now these fermented liquids were made with some kind of grass that's already healthy or some kind of plant material that already contains these enzymes. Sometimes we're going to add uh, cow manure to it, so cows that have grazed on pasture. And we're going to ferment this inside of a barrel and then use the f liquid from the fermentation as a dressing of the soil. Now, we do this even before seed goes out there, but uh, once the grass starts growing, we also put this out on the fields. Now, this, this liquid does have a smell to it, and it can be produced two ways. I have videos that go into depth on each of these ways, so we're just going to give you a high level right here. The first way is simply getting a barrel and filling it full of fresh cut clippings, putting water in it, and through anaerobic uh, digestion, we are going to uh, ferment that grass and we've added some cow manure to it to kind of kick it off because we want the stomach enzymes from the from the cow we want the enzymes that are on the grass we want to have all that stuff colonize and so you can either use a bubbling system where you put aerator in the bottom and get some air into it uh, and cultivate that set of bacterias and, and funguses and and all kinds of things and or you could uh, use it in a biodigester and just use the liquid that comes out of the biodigester. Now, in both ways, you will be creating methane gas. So if you could trap the gas and use it, that's all the better. But uh, what we're doing is we're fermenting the grass over two or three days, squeezing off that liquid, which is a liquid fertilizer, but it's an enzymatic fertilizer. It contains different things. Now, can this process contain E. coli and other things? Yes. You do not want to get this liquid on you, uh, but you can put it over the soil at a rate of 1 to 5 or 1 to 10. And that means for every part of the liquid, you add additional parts water. So this will burn grass in some cases because it is a very strong 
fertilizer. Uh, but what we're doing is we're inoculating the soil set. Now, you can also inoculate with different fungal uh, activity uh, because some fungal activities will remove grubs, some uh, will deter moles. It just really depends on your area. And the way to do that is to find f funguses that grow in your area, blend them in a blender with some water, and then uh, provide that over top of the, of the soil. Or you can buy spores or you can buy uh, different kinds of, of powdery mixes. But the key is what we're doing to the soil is creating the very best environment for the plants to grow. Okay, now next thing we're going to do is we're going to choose the right seeds. Most people make the mistake of just going out and buying grass seed and putting it out there. Now some grasses grow tall, some grasses grow short, some grasses grow fast, some grasses grow slow. Your field or area where you want to grow grass has different light conditions. So some grass grows in the shade, some grass grows in the sun, some grass has high nutritional value, some grass has low nutritional value. Now you could go get a pasture, pasture blend of grass, which typically has three to four types of grasses. Might have, uh, t can, you know, Kentucky bluegrass, it could have, uh, there's just a bunch of different kinds of grasses. The ideal, though, is to mimic the grasses that are likely to be in your area as native grasses. Now, native grasses themselves do not have a high choleric value when it comes to having animals graze on it. And that might be better suited for areas where you need the deep root structure in order to prevent erosion. So what I ended up doing is the Heinz 57 of grasses, but I made sure I had in it low pile white clover okay white cl clover is a nitrogen fixing plant and we wanted to have that in there to actually feed the trees so now we got the soil a little bit better so the nu nutrient exchange is cleaner and now we want to add nutrients to the soil which is atmospheric nitrogen not actually nitrogen that you buy at the store and that atmospheric nitrogen goes in through the cl clover now when we're establishing grass and we have animal pressure we want to have red clover in there because red clover is going to give you a little bit more bulk, gives the animals something to eat. Now, you want to keep animals off of this until you have a good, thick, 50% density of grass. We'll tell you what that means here in a little bit. But the seed mix that you're choosing has to do with the, the combination of conditions as well as both bulk of grass and feeding. So you could have white clover or yellow clover, you can have red clover, you can have alfalfa in there, you can have other nitrogen fixing uh, legumes in there. And so we're not really establishing grass initially, more of a cover crop. So we want to go quick, quickly from clay soil, maybe a light top dressing of compost or topsoil, and then we're inoculating all of that. We're, we're using native uh, bio, biome in the sense of the soil inoculation, uh, in sense of the maybe we're using compost tea, we're, maybe we're fermenting and using that liquid. Then we're establishing the cover crop, which is 50-50 grass and legumes. And then after the grass starts to establish, and we're going to have three to four different types of grass there, we are now into the management stage. So what, one thing about applying the seed, though, is that we apply the seed in series. So we apply the seed immediately when the, gr the ground is uh, disturbed, and then we'll come back later and we'll seed again, and we're using like a one-third mixture. So if they recommend you know, a pound of seed per acre or two pounds of seed per acre, we're going to put one-third of that in initially, and then we're going to come back later in a couple months, put another third down and then another third down because, again, we don't necessarily have the – uh, the environmental conditions necessary for those seeds to thrive. So we're, we're using time to have a better chance of hitting the right conditions. We also want to dust our seed with straw, and, and we're going to do that each time we seed. So the straw is actually there to keep the birds from eating the seed because the birds will eat the seed. Now we start getting those young sprouts. You get that green haze across the, gar across the lawn, and that grass starts to grow. Now, the first reflex in an urban space is that when grass gets about six inches high, to go in there and mow it. But we have to understand a few things about how grass functions and how grass grows in order to mow at the right times and the right height. So now we're looking at that third part. This is a three-legged stool. You need to do all three of these well. You don't have to do them perfect, 
but all three of these will, and you'll get grass that grows annoyingly fast. Now, again, annoyingly fast in an urban space is, is what I discovered, but if I was in a pasture or a field, I could simply just put animals on it because, as we're going to talk about shortly, that cutting cycle is just as valuable in the growth of the grass as the planting cycle. And when I talk about 50% density, and that's at the point where we can put pressure on the soil. I'm talking about if you if you drew out a one foot by one foot square and you determine the square inches and then you determined the amount of space the grass takes up, we want to have 50% or more being took up by grass. So this is a, a survey method that gives you a – you could do four or five samples, then you do the math, and you'll know that, that the, the surface area is covered 50% by grass. We don't want to worry about the clover. We don't, don't want to worry about the other plants that are in there. We want to know that grass stalks are taking up 50% or more of the surface area in our samples. And now what this does is this allows us to have less – open space on the soil, less exposed soil, and then as we mow appropriately or we scythe appropriately, any of the thatch that falls will fall between the grass and provide additional habitat for worms, microbes, uh, and the biome that is in the soil that is ultimately feeding the grass. We also want to make sure that we get enough root establishment before we start cutting the grass as well. So on our level areas, we can start cutting the grass at 6 to 10 inches if the grass is at 50% density. We need to look at the grass to make sure it doesn't become stalky because we want to cut the grass before it goes to seed. We're cutting the grass before it goes to seed. And by the way, this is a complete course. You do this, it will work. I want to see more grass. Grass captures carbon from the atmosphere. Grass protects soil. It, it holds nutrients. It provides food for your animals. I want you to use this. And tell me how well it works because ultimately the more grass you have on your property, unless you have trees, you know, but you need the grass to establish the trees. But my point is, if you cut it too soon, you're going to leave bare spots that will be damaged. If you cut it too late, the grass will be all stalky and you won't have the, the leaf surface area necessary to have the photosynthesis that gives you healthy, strong growth. So we're looking to cut the grass after it has two or more side shoots. So you're going to get down there, and my neighbors looked at me like I was an idiot, but you're going to get down there on your hands and knees, and you're going to be raking through the grass with your hands, looking for grass that the majority in that sample area has two or more side branching leaves. And, and so you're going, to, you're going to look, and it depends on the type of grass, what that's going to look like. But if it has the two or more, then you can cut as up to one-third of the biomass out of the grass so if the grass is six inches tall you can cut off two inches and so that's one third of the total height of the grass you can cut off and that means you're going to have four inches tall grass now for a lot of people that's very confusing because four inches seems like a tall deep thick grass but that's what we're looking for here folks we're looking to cultivate tall thick grass now mechanically, initially, you're going to cut the grass mechanically. There will be areas like slopes that are more difficult to access where we may allow the grass to grow 6 inches, 10 inches, 18 inches, because, again, as tall as the grass is, that's how deep the roots are going to be in the ground. And for slope stabilization, and I got this from the Department of uh, Forestry in Virginia, the, the, the deeper the roots are, the better the slope stabilization. And then that grass can be cut uh, if it gets a little stalky, or it has more than two shoots, it can be just cut with a scythe and then rake the materials raked off the top. Now, what do we do with the materials that we rake off the grass? Because if it's level ground and you're mechanically mowing it, you can simply just leave that thatch on the soil because you're only taking off one-third of the, the growth. But on a slope, you need to take off all of the extra grass because it's gonna, you don't want it to clump and kill the grass on the slope. What do we do with that grass we raked off? Well, the best thing to do is to chop it up and go back to where we started. Ferment that grass and then use the fermented materials to put back on the soil. And that's going to, again, it's going to help start cultivating this biome. We're going to test the soil pH and we're going to move that soil pH as close to neutral as we can get it. It doesn't have to be neutral. It could be a little acidic. It could be a little base. It doesn't matter as long as it's as close to neutral as we can get it. 
And then we're going to sample the, the pasture area or the lawn area to make sure that we have consistent application because there could be some areas such as under oak trees that are a little more acidic and might need some spot liming. And, and we always use, again, the one-third method where if they, if they would recommend a pound of lime, we're going to put one-third of that on and then we're going to do it over a cycle of time with testing. Are you still with me? Because this sounds like a lot of work, but I'm going to give you a very easy way to make it less work. But the point being is that we're cultivating soil biology. We're overseeding and sometimes top dressing with compost, but we're certainly uh, adding this liquid fertilizer that's coming from the grass itself. We're fermenting the grass. We're expanding its biological elements or benefits, and then we're putting it back out on there. If the pH level is good, you're going to tend to have good, better enzymes and you're going to have less likely to have that rancid look. So if you're doing this fermentation and you got like a white film over the top of it or it just sounds kind of rancid, you can put some air into it and kind of loosen that up. You can also take the grass clippings and compost them and then use that biologically active compost as a top dressing. Now, if you're doing this for a lawn, how do you get your grass from 6 to 8 inches down to what a lot of people like is like a 2-inch grass? Well, I'm going to tell you, you don't do that because that's kind of dumb. Uh, if your front lawn is only two inches high, it's not retaining water. It's not retaining moisture. It's not soaking materials into the ground. You'll tend to have evaporation before the water can soak into the ground. Uh, you're going to tend to have these weird spots and things because the grass will get scorched. I'm recommending a four to five inch, even six inch cut for a lawn. Now, that's where I get into a little bit of challenge in a city because, again, this grass method can add feet to your grass in the course of a week during your rainy season. And that's appropriate for slopes, but it's not necessarily appropriate for near your house. And so it can get out of hand. And we're going to, again, tell you a way to keep it maintained fast and forever and uh, create a huge value out of this. But do you see what we're doing here? We're respecting the soil. We're giving the plant the ideal growing conditions. We're cutting the grass at appropriate times. So we're cutting it before it goes to seed. And we're cutting it uh, be, uh, when it's had enough growth on it to show us that it's recovering from the cut. We're using mowers with very sharp blades. We're using mowers that are balanced out. And we're going over the grass slowly. We're not buzzing through it on a, on a zero turn and blowing grass everywhere. We're only cutting one-third of the grass off, which is an, enough that we are leveling out the grass so you get that nice clean look and we get the grass clippings fall down and they are easily digested or decomposed on the soil surface. So you don't need to dethatch or anything because you're actually building soil. You're building a blanket over top of that clay and you're protecting that soil and you're really just feeding the grass with its own clippings. So you don't necessarily need to bag it. If you bag it, you can ferment it and use the liquids to, to treat the, the soil. Um, but ultimately... We're now getting into these cycles where we're, we're getting this thicker, thicker grass that grows very quickly. And on slopes, we might let it grow three or four feet tall. Because again, slope stabilization is more important than a beautiful uh, clean cut of grass. Also, on slopes, we're cutting it differently and removing the biomass. But the bottom line here, folks, is there is an easier way to manage this. Because you might be saying, well, Justin, it sounds like a lot of mowing. And it might be. But what if you just let the grass grow? And now you go from grass to savanna. And from savanna, you can go to a tree system. It's initially going to be pines. It's going to be nitrogen-fixing trees. And then from a basic tree system, you go to a forest system, which may include different layers of the forest. It could even become a food forest which would eventually shade out the, the ground and all the grass would go away. Now you could go into silvopasture, which would allow strips of trees and grass in between it. And so you still have the grazing value. But you've eliminated all of the mowing and, and things like that. And what will happen, and we showed it in a number of videos, is the grass will grow really tall. And then in a storm, it'll all get knocked over. And then new grass will grow through that old grass because the seed, of course, drops. And then the cycle will continue and you'll end up with a layer of topsoil. And so we've now turned atmospheric carbon into a biome. And that biome becomes a savanna or grassland. 
and it becomes habitat for deer. It becomes habitat for rabbits. It will not attract a bunch of rats and mice. It just doesn't work that way because when the seed falls and the mice come, then foxes will come and eat the mice. Owls will eat the mice. Other beneficial creatures higher in the food chain will come and eat the mice. You also have black snakes and other things eat the mice. And so ultimately, this is something you can do in your zone four. You can do, some, do this in your zone five. You can do this to reestablish an area after it's been forested. You can do this to transform an area from unused and derelict to a forest system. It is a powerful approach. If you want to turn this into pasture, we can eliminate the mowing by adding grazing animals. Now, sheep will cut the grass off really short. And it's okay because if the grass is biologically active and has the enzymes, if the soil is has a good pH, then when the sheep eat the grasses, they're essentially pelletizing the grass and re-inoculating the grass and putting it back onto the soil. So the grass, after the initial establishment and the initial mowing routines, the grass will tolerate the sheep, even though they might cut it off pretty low, but you want to monitor them. You don't want them to eat half of it or, or eat three quarters of it. You want them to eat a third off the top and move them to the next field. That might mean uh, uh, different rotation cycles. It might mean more sheep or less sheep. But ultimately, the sheep will mow the grass for you. Now, let's say you like grass-fed beef and you've got a little more acreage. Well, the same thing goes. Now, now cows are going to more rip the grass. They're going to grab it and rip it, and that's okay. If the grass is tall enough... When they go to rip the grass, they're not going to pull the roots out of the ground. So you want to monitor, again, monitor your moisture levels because the cows will imprint the soil. You want to monitor the, um, the amount of grass that they're consuming in a day. And, you, of course, you want to keep them moving across the grass so that we can keep the establishment there. But the same technique I shared here also works to repair pasture. So those cows are out there, and they've imprinted the pasture. They've manured the pasture, which is the same as what we're doing with the top dressing. They've peed all over the pasture, which is the same that we're doing with the uh, inoculation of enzymes. So the manures and the rain will inoculate the enzymes, and the pee will inoculate the enzymes. So essentially what you can do is keep cows on a field for a short period of time, drag the field afterwards, and then on the, in the impressions, so you can seed it right after they've been on it, you can come through and drag it, and then so that spreads out the manure. And then you can leave the field idle for it to grow back. Now, it could grow back with some weeds in it or other things that you don't want. And that's what we're going to do with the, uh, the, the, the sampling and monitoring to make sure we don't have a lot of that. And so there may be times where you want to impound animals longer than other times. But there might be a series of times where you uh, do like Joel Salaston talks about and move the cows and then follow them with chickens who will do the spreading for you, and then they'll eat a lot of those weed seeds, and then after the chickens are off, you seed the field, drag it, and do your testing, and then let the field recover. Now, what will tend to happen over time is you, if, if you keep the grass rotation and cutting, uh, you know, you don't put the cows back on the grass until you've got two or three uh, of the, the side shoots. It's showing the grass is recovered. Um, if you keep the rotation strong, you, you don't have to seed. You could probably seed once a year. You could probably seed every two years. But the key is the en enzymatic cycles, soil pH, blend of grasses, blend of nitrogen-fixing plants, and the way that we're monitoring the density of the grass, the way that we're monitoring the height of the grass, and the pressure on the grass – all of these things come together, and, and I'm starting to get passionate about this type of activity, but all these things come together to make your grass grow. And what you've now learned is not annoying to you because it's calories. Uh, so whether you're running sheep, cows, goats don't typically like the grass a lot unless it gets too overgrown, and then you can come in and they'll eat all the woody stalks, stalks down and they'll trample the grass. Um, chickens on pasture, rabbits on pasture, you're now able to take a piece of land, recover it from bare soil, establish a savanna or grassland area, and now come in with animals. Now, if you just want to leave it all alone, you can use this to, uh, to ha create habitat for quail. 
You can use this to go from feed plot to savanna with heavy deer. So deer love tall grass. You want to cut uh, channels in it. You want to cut paths in it so the, so the deer can move through the grass and feel protected, yet still have a line of sight. We talk about that in other videos. But the key here is it doesn't take a lot of monitoring. I know people get passionate about their lawns. You're going to have that same level of passion, except you're going to be producing calories for animals. So you're going to have meat on the hoof. You're going to be producing habitat for, for birds and bees and beneficial insects. You're going to be supporting wildlife and the health of your wildlife. You're going to have less inputs. So I didn't say anything about bringing in anything other than seeds. You want to make sure your seed blend is appropriate for your area. Uh, you're going to have biomass because as we've shown in the grass-fed garden videos, as we've shown in the composting videos, when you take that grass off, you can uh, compost it. You're going to have winter feed because many of these fields, if, you've, if you're cutting hay, you can cut into hay and turn it to, to bales, the store. This is a blessing. It's annoying to people in the city that don't understand it. It's annoying to urban spaces that have zoning laws that say you can't have grass taller than 10 inches, even on slopes. By the way, if you cut your grass two inches on a slope, you will have erosion. No matter how thick that grass is, you'll have erosion. You'll have the need for outside resources. You'll have nutrients wash off. You're going to have so many soil wash off. You're going to have so many problems. Six inches is what you need. Um, the even lawn in the front yard, six inches. You take your shoes off and you walk around in that. Oh, it feels so great. The grass is so thick. Neighbors will be envious. Actually, I've had neighbors that are confused. So they'll come in and they'll say, I've been driving by your yard. Your yard is beautiful. It's so thick, green and luscious. And then they come in and they say, oh, why does it have those little clover in it? You should put a weed and feed on that. Uh, why is it so tall? You should cut that. I said, well, now wait a second. When you saw it from a distance, you were you had a heart on. But when you see it up close, now you're all confused. What's the confusion? Take your shoes off and walk around in this grass. And they're like, oh, oh, we don't walk in our lawn. You can walk in this lawn. This lawn will take the pressure. I've had somebody, I don't even know who they are, take their shoes off, walk around in my yard. The smile opens up on their face and they're like, wow, this is nice. I see what you mean. Now, it can be cut at four inches. It can cut at five inches. I think I'm usually around four to five inches, but it'll grow out. Um, but the walking around barefoot, is the is the the closing to the sale because the clovers feed in the grass the grass has enough density in the soil to protect the soil and it remains nice and cool and fresh on a 90 degree day and you're feeling your feet on the ground it's almost cold that never has to be watered that never has to be fed with fertilizers one of the reasons people don't walk on their lawns is because they know it's a toxic cesspool of weed and feed and and chemicals and nasty sprays the worst thing that's going to happen in my lawn is that you're going to maybe i don't know lay down and take a nap because again the soil is healthy the plants are healthy when your body touches that you're going to feel that and i know maybe it's because i'm out there in the grass on my hands and knees just feeling around and parting the grass and looking at it and i've got a ruler out there and i'm measuring the density and i'm doing math you know you don't i'm more of a citizen scientist than anything else but the the cycle of process is uh complementary to an ecosystem which doesn't inhibit growth it traps and soaks in nutrients it's soil that's biologically active so there's that nutrient exchange the plants are are doing their photosynthesis and bringing starches down to the soil while pumping up water the starches are being exchanged with the mushrooms and the enzymes which they are then giving sugars to the plant or giving other nutrients to the plants the yard takes care of itself the grasses that are more suitable for shade grow fine in the shade the grasses that are more suitable for sun tend to dominate the sunny areas. But altogether, you're creating biomass by uh, trapping carbon from the atmosphere and the soil. You're creating uh, feed for animals. You're creating feed for a compost bin. You're creating compost for your garden. You're creating a luscious, beautiful ecosystem that you can be proud of. You can walk around barefoot, throw, throw a picnic blanket out there the kid used to throw a blanket out there and just lay in the grass look at this look at this clouds 
You're creating a recreational space. You're creating an environment that doesn't require a lot of maintenance because grass actually will start slowing down its growth as it's at five to six inches. And so you're cutting it off. It's going to, instead of every week growing back, it will grow back uh, a little bit slower in the areas that you're keeping cropped. Now, in the areas that you're not keeping cropped, it will grow a foot in the rainy season. And you don't necessarily want to mow it because it hasn't put out its other shoots. Uh, But again, if you're rotating animals, if you're willing to understand the difference between a slope and a flat area, if you're willing to cultivate, you're going to have what looks like a PGA golf course. And that is the bigger secret of this. The methods that I've described to you here are the holistic and natural methods used for some of the PGA golf courses, uh, some of the uh, natural ecosystems. It's recommended by the Department of Forestry. It's been studied by universities who want uh, pastures for uh, grass-fed beef. Now, I've simplified things a little bit. There's, you know, There are times you might add calcium or you might add nutrients. It depends on the condition of the field initially. Um, and then ultimately, it is environmentally friendly. You can restore habitat. If you're going to go the, the, the channel of wild animals, it's a little bit different. If you're going to go the channel of domesticated animals, you're going to put in fencing. It's going to be a little bit different. But it will grow like crazy. And I see that growth as abundance. I see that growth as we're doing something right. We're capturing carbon, we're sequestering it from the atmosphere. We're creating a grass as a resource. And we talk about that a lot in the videos. And we're ultimately working with nature rather than against it. It is unnatural to cut your grass at two inches. Now, when a PGA golf course cuts their grass, grass at two inches, they're doing that and they're, they're putting sand in and they're doing other things because it's a golf course. It's not your front yard. Uh, and, and they're doing that because they're getting paid large amounts of money to do it. But it's not co- the cost-benefit analysis for a homeowner is not there to pretty much damage and shock the grass every time you go through. Um, if you're cutting off a third of the grass, you could slowly get it down to three or four inches if you, if you want that. But ultimately, a five-inch grass that has a 80 to 90% density you could throw a ball out on it and it won't it won't indent. You leave footprints in the yard every time you walk across it. You can lay in that grass and feel the coolness of the ground on the hottest and sunniest day. You don't have to drag hoses around in water. You don't need a watering system. This kind of approach is magical in the growth it gives you. It also tells you when to put animals on and when to take animals off. It also helps you use the uh, bi- biome and eco uh, fertilizers that are already available on your property. And then it ultimately helps you have green grass year round. If you have questions about this method, I do have a, a training program where we go on site and we look specifically at different lawns. And then we list out some of the holistic things that can be done to either turn that grass into pasture, turn that grass into natural habitat. And there will be times you might want to overseed with uh, natural grasses. Um, natural uh, Native Virginia grasses tend to clump. Uh, so we, we, we might want to do that because you're doing a, an English um, uh, natural garden where you've got paths and it's an exhibit space. I'll be happy to look at your uh, nonprofit or your uh, your history place. The key is this stuff is management. And it's pretty common management to places who pride themselves on an ecosystem of grass rather than a, a commercial, sanitized, cosmetic grass. And that's permaculture aligned that's people health that's nature health that's good quality soil i want to thank you for listening if you have questions about this visit www.prosperityhomestead.org where we have numerous resources some of the videos i mentioned will be there uh, and there's a free newsletter so you can go to the contact page ask your question or you can join our free newsletter thanks for listening i'm justin hit with prosperity homestead